Hey, everybody. How are you today? You're good. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. You know, where the house of the Lord is, there's hope. And, mm. and I love what it says on your brochure. It says, welcome home, mm. because God has a place for you in this home. He has a place for you that you'll fit into this, into this body, and you will be not only fulfilled, but you will, be, you will fulfill prophecy for somebody else. You know, sometimes it's as we get ourselves out of the way that God begins to throw us his way, Right. So anyways, I wanted to just share a word that God had given me earlier for Pastor Chad and for his wife Heidi. Uh, When I came in, I don't know if you know um, the Queen of Sheba who heard about the fame of the tabernacle, and she said, I need to go see it from my own eyes. And when I came in the the auditorium, I felt like that same fame of God's glory in the house was in this house. And not only that, but God's wisdom of how he was going to roll his house out was in this house. So I'm just so grateful that you're, you're plugging in and that you're a part of it. So, Abba, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your strong arm, God. We thank you that you stretch out your arm and you bring salvation and that you stretch out your arm and you bring redemption. So we thank you that your strong arm is reaching out over California and you're quenching the fires mm-hmm. and you're restoring families and you're bringing beauty out of ashes mm-hmm. in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Do you believe that with me? Everybody say amen. Amen. Because I know you you appreciated it when people were praying for you when we all went through that. So we need to stand in the gap as his body and pray for those. Amen. Mm. Amen. God bless you. you. Some people have a better half. I have a better five eighths to seven eighths. Because I I need I need more. Um so uh, I have a message for you today. It's it's called Yes and Amen. Because all his promises are yes and amen. And it's really about God's love story and you, where you fit in to God's love story. But before we, we get into the message, I want you to take out your cell phones. <laughs> if you don't have one, you just memorize this. Take out your cell phone and take a picture of this slide because I have an ulterior motive. I want to connect with you because we are producing newsletters and videos and things, not for sale, for, for you to understand the bigger scope of the message that I'm going to bring you today. We are living in a season when God is awakening the church around the world to our roots, our Hebrew roots, and he wants to do it in a way that's not weird. That's where I come in. Uh, and so what we will do is, if, if you get in touch with us, we'll, we'll have uh, news you can use, views you haven't seen about the Jews and news. It's really good. It's very helpful. And it'll connect you with some of the things you'll hear about today. This will spark your interest today, I think, in, in what God's doing and how there's this parallel destiny between the restoration of the people of Israel to the land and to coming to our Messiah and this revival that's taking place around the world. We are in a season of revival. Do not believe what you see on CNN. It's what you, we, in Israel we call it certainly not the news. <laughs> Do not believe it and don't believe what you hear from the United Nations. In Israel we call it the United Nothing. Because there's another story that God is writing, and you are that story. He's writing a story about light and life and power and change and transformation. And it's connected to this restoration of this little group of people in the Middle East that he said from the beginning that he was going to do. He's going to do this restoration. And when you see it unfolding, you begin to realize that you are part of a long love story. So so we're, we're, uh, I'm just excited. Come on, this can work. This can work. You, gotta t- you have to turn these on. Jesus didn't need this one. So, Chad, Pastor Chad asked me to talk about eschatology. Do you know what that is? It's the study of the end times. Eschatology is a big word, and it, it mean, has a lot of meanings, and a lot of people have a lot of different approaches to eschatology. There are different, different ways of looking at the end times, and, and everyone thinks they're right. When I was in Bible college, we knew exactly what was going to happen when and how it was going to unfold and how it was who and who was what. And we just were very sure of everything. As I go further in this, I'm less and less sure. I think it has to do with age and wisdom. You get a little flexible. You get older. It's like, well, you know, we'll see. You know, we'll see. It's the old story about the rabbi. He's doing counseling. I'm a therapist by day. This rabbi's doing counseling. And he's, so his wife hears the arguing in the back room in the office. The, the man and the woman that he's counseling, they're fighting, fighting. And he hears, he, he, she hears her husband say to the wife, you're right. She hears her husband say to the husband, you're right. 
he comes out, the people leave. His wife goes up to him and says, how can he be right and she be right? And the rabbi says, you know, you're also right. <laughs> so we have all these different views of the end times. And they really clash and they, they kind of bang up against each other. And I wanted to bring you a word from Ecclesiastes to open, which gives you an idea of the difference between God's thoughts and man's thoughts. A final word, Ecclesiastes 12. A final word when all has been heard. Fear God and keep his mitzvot, his instructions, for this applies to all mankind. God will bring every deed into judgment, including everything that is hidden, whether it is good or evil. The words of the wise are like goads. Their collective sayings are like firmly affixed nails. They've been given by one shepherd. Be warned, my son, my daughter, of anything in addition to them. There is no end to the making of many books. An excessive study wearies the flesh. We have centuries upon centuries of theologies and end times theologies and views of the world that are based upon good intention, man's best thinking, and have led us into places where we miss a very central part of what God is actually doing in the earth and how we can know where we are in time and what it means to us. One of my early teachers used to preach and at the end he'd say, so what? Like, what is, what's in it for me? What does this mean? It was the Jewish way of doing Joyce Myers, what about me, what about me? And he would say, so what? You know, does this have any relevance to my life? And the answer is yes, it does. It does because it gets you connected to the long love story of God and helps you find your place in that story. Now, if you've never been to church before, just, you know, this is not the usual cup of tea. I am definitely the double espresso of the body of Christ. And so it's a, it may be a little bit weird for you, but Pastor Chad will straighten you out and he'll help you smooth that out. If you've never heard about what, Jews in church, what's going on? Jews in the pews? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yes, God's intention has always been for Jews and Gentiles to worship him together. That's why he came to the house of Israel, and then we brought the word out to the whole world. And now you're bringing the word back to my people, and my people are getting saved, coming to faith in more numbers than any time since the book of Acts. Why? Because Messiah is coming. He's coming back. So... So a, a dear professor named Arnold Fruchtenbaum, who I interviewed on TV, he's a, he's a very quiet talker, but I interviewed him on TV. He's a genius, and he came up with this term to understand what's going on in all these ways of looking at the end. He calls it Israelology. If you want to have an appropriate theology to understand politics, the headlines, what's going on in the world, and where we're going, the only way to understand it is through this. And this speaks excessively about the place of Israel in the history of the world and in the future kingdom to come. So Israelology, this is my words. I, I said it this way. God's love story includes a chosen family, Abraham, through whom he will bring a worldwide redemption, Jesus, we're living in the times the prophets longed for. Israel in Scripture provides the most accurate lens through which to view God's purposes and his eschatology. So if we're going to take a road trip, and we're going to end the road trip this today, the road trip starts in Jerusalem and ends in Jerusalem. So here I am. I'm here to tell you that you're on the right road. <laughs> and in fact, all roads do not lead to Rome. All roads lead to Jerusalem. This gospel came from this little place, has gone around the world, is now rising in the east in China and in Asia, and they're bringing this gospel through the 1040 window, the missions window of the unreached people groups, back to Jerusalem. God knows what he's doing. So here's the word for today, for in him, all the promises of God are yes. Therefore, also through him is the amen by us to the glory of God. He says it, we have to believe it. He says it, we agree. We say amen, so be it. Yes, I believe it, I agree, so be it. And this whole story begins with God's promise to Abraham. It actually begins in the garden with the fall. No, no, it actually begins before the foundation of the world when the lamb was slain for your salvation. Actually, it begins in the heart and mind of God who wanted a family. And wanted a family who could be close to him and like him. And created us to be in his image. And then we fell by our own decisions and choice. We chose the natural and the ungodly instead of his ways. And we fell. And so now he sends Jesus so that we can be back in relationship with him. That's a good God. He's a good, good father. Hey. <clears throat> Just got inspired to write a song. Oh, yeah. 
Okay, so Abraham, God says to Abram, by the way, Abram was wandering around in idol worship. In fact, the, the, the historians believe his family were idol makers. So he was in the biz of pagan worship. His family, he, he knew a guy. He was in the family business of idol worship. God calls him. He changes his name to Abraham. What happens when you take that H? We call it an H. In Hebrew, it's the letter He. It's the fifth letter of the alphabet in Hebrew. And it's the letter for five. It means grace. So God takes Abram, calls him, and then breathes that H into him. Breathes the grace of God into him so that he can fulfill the calling that's on his life, which is to become the father of many nations. And he says this, I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. You can look at the history of planet Earth and watch the rising and falling of civilizations based on how they treat the Jews. Sorry, if you're here and you have an anti-Semitic background, I forgive you, but you need to get forgiven by God because it really is getting in the way of your full appropriation of what God is doing in Christianity. Because it's, it's a one long story. And right now, he's restoring the Jewish people in levels that are commensurate with what he's doing in the church. What he's doing in the church, which is phenomenal around the world. So, I will make you a great nation. In you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And watch this. Not only so, I'm going to be your God of generations. So, Isaac, the miracle child, the promised child, comes. And he gets a promise also. Adonai, God, appeared to him, to Isaac, and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land about which I tell you. For to you and to your seed I give all these lands. And I will confirm my pledge that I swore to Abraham your father. Son, father and son. And he said, goes on with Isaac to say, I will multiply your seed like the stars of the sky. And I will give your seed all these lands. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth will continually be blessed. That continual blessing is the Messiah, is Jesus. Now God goes on to the third generation and he promises to Jacob. So Adonai gave to Israel the entire land that he had sworn to give to their fathers. They took possession and settled in it. So what we're seeing is something, this is my term, is covenantal continuity. It's not dispensationalism. It's not amillennial, postmillennial. It's none of that stuff. It's not panmillennial. It'll all work out. It's none of that. It's, it's covenantal continuity that God sets something in motion. And because he's not a man that he should lie, he brings it to pass. He does it. He says it. He does it. And then we have to decide whether we believe it. Right? And he's doing it. So what does he promise? He promises Abraham a family. He promised you a family. I don't know if you were like me wandering out in space and God called you by name and placed you in the church and it's the only place you've ever really belonged. Yeah. You know, anybody here like that? Like, wow, I am home. That brochure, that, what that says, that program, that's right. I'm home. Right. You're home in the family of God. Yeah. Yeah. He gives you a place. He's giving Israel. He's restoring our family. He's taking our family and putting our family in a place. That place is his promised land. He's placed you in a family, and he's brought you to a place. The place is here. This is your home base. This is here, right? But it has to do with also the expansion of your reach. What does he want to do with you? From Where does he want to minister through you? In what ways? That's part of the place, is that these are the things that God's given me to do and how to do them. And then he promises Abraham... Messiah. He says, through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. In other words, it's through this particular family that I'm going to bring Jesus. And I'm going to redeem the world. So just like that, he, he's done that with you. Your promises are here. He's promised you a family. He's promised you a place. And he's promised you Jesus. And here you are. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus yet, do not leave here without him. It is the high adventure. Walking with the Lord is high adventure. We've been around the world, some of the garden spots of the world. Took my wife to the Congo. We lived there. We went to Siberia. We did ministry there. We've been to northern India. Some of those diff most difficult places. Hallelujah. That we get to be part of something bigger than ourselves. When my son was in preschool, he had a sign on his bedroom that he got at preschool. It says, Joy, Jesus, others, you. So we would work that on him all the time. Ha! You want joy? Jesus, others, you. You're third. You're... 
a little rough with a four, five, six-year-old kid. Now he's married. He just got married. Hallelujah. <laughs> married a beautiful girl, wonderful girl. We're totally in love with her. And uh, Jesus others you. They'll have to figure that out. We've been married 32 years. We're still figuring that out. Jesus others you. You know, can you put the other first? Can you be part of something bigger than yourself? Can you get out of the way and let God minister to someone in need? So he is the God of generations. That, that's what we see in this Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the God of generations. So I would say to you today, do you have a loved one, a child, or a niece, or a nephew, or a grandparent, or a co-worker? You have somebody you're praying for. They need the Lord. They need salvation, or healing, or deliverance, or financial increase, or some kind of change. They need God. Raise your hand. Anybody in your life have like that besides you? Anybody? Hold your hand up for a second. Father, by your word. We bless your name. We thank you that you're a miracle-working God. You're the same miracle-working God that is here today that brought us through the wilderness. And God, today you've set these aside for thus, thus such a day as this. And so we ask you to answer, to honor, to bring that one home to complete that which you've begun, to give them the desires of their heart that none should perish, but all come to everlasting life. Amen. Amen. Your family will be blessed. You know, we see it in, in, in Acts when the Philippian jailer says, the earthquake, and the, and the guys are released, and it's just this tumult, and he says, whoa, what does this mean? And they say very simply, put your trust in the Lord Jesus. Put your trust, have faith in Jesus, and you will be saved and your house, and your house. That was a rhema word to the Philippian jailer, but it's a living word for us. We live on that word. We, we've seen it. We've seen it in our families. We prayed with everyone in our family for salvation. It's a little like whack-a-mole. I can't get them all to church at the same time, but that's okay. You know, everybody's got their own pathway, but they, they've all prayed the prayer with us. My mom and my sister, my little Jewish mother, got saved before she went to heaven. My sister as well, right? And we're a tough crowd. We're a tough crowd. I'll explain that in a minute. Here's what God says to you today. Behold, I have engraved you on the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. I know what you're dealing with. I get it. I get it. I've, I've got your back. I've got you. It's going to be okay. I've got you. Your, your name is engraved on my hands. Now, Jesus came to the Jews first. I don't know if you taught that, were taught that, but that's what happened. He said... I have been sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, because he's so awesome, he was going to raise up this Jewish group of disciples, apostles, and then they would go out, as in John 17, and proclaim to the world that they could, the world, the Gentile world, could be one with him as he was one with his father. So through you, he said, they will realize that we are one, right? And so that's, how, that's the progression of this. That's part of this love story. So he comes to this little gnarly little group of small people, my family, I get to say it, and he brings Messiah, he brings salvation. And because he's so gracious, our rejection has been the salvation of the world. If so, it says in Romans, what will our acceptance be but life from the dead? And I'm here to tell you that we are connected in such a visceral, spiritual way that as the Jewish people are restored to the land, as Israel is reborn, as we are producing incredible gifts for the entire world, no matter what you see in the news, the truth is Israel is producing incredible gifts to the world. And as that's happening, we're also seeing spiritual revival around the world. They're connected because he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we, we're not going to disappear, no matter what jihadists might think, or many Europeans and others, we're not going to disappear. You're not going to get rid of the Jews. Mark Twain said, what is the secret of the Jews' immortality? Because we're so strong and tall and smart and beautiful. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I, I know that was a yes and amen, but... Uh, no, his answer was, the answer is the God of the Jews. The same God you serve, the same God you love, the one who grafted you in through Jesus at the cross. That God is the reason why there are any Jews at all. There's only 14 million of us in the world. It's 0.02% of the population of the world. Very few. We have 22% of the Nobel Prizes. I don't mean Yasser Arafat's Nobel Peace Prize. 
That's all I'm talking about. I mean that we have 22% of the prizes for science and medicine and breakthrough and art and music and literature and all the blessings of Abraham that continue because God's so gracious. So this is what he said. Thus says the Lord, this is to Jeremiah, through Jeremiah, who gives the sun for light by day and the fixed order of the moon and the stars for light by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar. The Lord of hosts is his name. If this fixed order departs from before me, then the offspring of Israel will also cease forever from being a nation before me forever. In other words, if I decide to take apart, dismantle the universe, then the Jews go with it. Otherwise, you can expect this to continue until I change it to a new heaven and new earth down the road of peace, but you can expect this to continue the way it is, and you can expect Israel to be alive because I said so. So, yeah, restoration. It's a word of restoration. God is always on the increase. The government is on his shoulders. It increases. He's always increasing. We're living in the time right now where he's, he's fulfilling these words to Amos, the prophet. I will bring back the captives of my people Israel. They shall build the waste cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink wine from them. They shall also make gardens and eat fruit from them. I will plant them in their... I will plant them in their land... No longer shall they be pulled up from the land I have given them, says the Lord your God. Why is there such contention over this little piece of real estate? The Muslims have billions of acres, millions, multiple millions of acres of land. Why is there contention over this? This is why. Because if the devil can make this of none effect, if he could possibly in some way make this to be a lie... And make God's word to be a lie, which he cannot do because he's not a man that he should lie. This is the only book that came out of eternity into time. It's the only heavenly book on earth. This is it. And so the devil's constantly pushing against that. And the restoration of Israel is a statement by God, watch me. This is what I'm doing. You can line up with it or not, but I'm telling you, I said it. I'm doing it. You better believe it. <laughs> Now, he's much nicer than me, but that's what I get out of him. <laughs> so along those lines, I forgot about these. I need you to pray for Israel. There's a card back there on how to do that. So please, pray for Israel. Get in touch with us. We want to we interact with you. We're looking for, we want to build an army in Northern California that understands these things and is willing to get behind them. Because I believe it's a key to revival. Robert Morris. Anybody heard of Robert Morris? Pastor Robert? Oh, yeah. Okay, Pastor... <laughs> I'll tell him you have a fan. My son goes to his church in Dallas. Robert Morris uh, has a small church of 35,000 people in Texas. And he says the reason why his church is blessed and the reason why it has grown is because they give the first 1% of their budget to Jewish ministry and to Israel. That is the single reason, he says, that his church has exploded the way it has. We're staffed part-time at the Father's House, which is part of the network. Pastor Dave is kind of the apostolic elder to this group, to Pastor Chad and others here. But we're up staff part-time there. We've been doing a ministry there called Beit Abba on the first and third Fridays, and they have picked up the 1% challenge. They've taken their 1% challenge and sent it to Israel every month. The first check they write is to Israeli ministries. And I believe that when you sow into Israel first, God will do what he says he's going to do with you. I believe that. I know it sounds completely self-serving, and well, of course the guy's trying to, blah, 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 uh-uh, uh-uh. I'm telling you, what God says, the gospel is to go to the Jew first and also to the nations, and I'm telling you what somebody who's got a kind of successful church has said, that that's why. So, said that to say, who won't like this? This is called the road to restoration. This is a, what happens when a New York Jew, a California Catholic, and a Muslim from Bethlehem meet each other in Jesus. This is a, it's a little DVD. I want to give it away. Nobody? Okay, it's fine. Oh, oh, somebody wants it? There you go. Can you get that? Uh, oh, 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 nice. Good man. <laughs> By the way, these, this is, it's not an 8-track tape. These are called, these are called DVDs. And, and back a long, long time ago, people used to put these in a little player, and then they would, it would spin around really fast, and you could see moving pictures from them. But you don't see him much anymore. So we have a few left from when we were doing television for six years. But this one uh, is this is one of my favorites. It's called The Sons of Promise. We did one called Abraham. 
And then we went to Isaac and Jacob. This is about that, but it's not just the biblical story of what happened. It really shows what God's doing today through the sons of Israel. Like all the technology, all this great stuff that's happening in Israel. It's really kind of cool. This is called Sons of Promise, Isaac and Jacob. So who would like this? I saw your hand. Yes, 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 yes. If I throw it to you, I'm going to bean somebody. Let's pass it back. Can we do that? Good, good, good. All right, then. No, I'm keeping that. <laughs> All right. God is a God of restoration. He wants to transform us. And one of the greatest evangelistic tools and obvious statements that God is God, because he does it on the macro level, is the restoration of Israel. Mark Twain went there in 1867, and he said, yikes, what a dump. What a mess. There's nothing. I'm paraphrasing. He came back, and he wrote, a book, he wrote an article called Innocent Abroad. And he talks about his journeys there, and he talks about the, the, the misery in the 1800s that was the Middle East. And he talks about the, the just random few Jews here and a couple Arabs there, and just, it was just nothing, nothing, barren. So when this modern restoration started before the Holocaust, the Jews had to go and dig out the rocks one by one from the land in order to reclaim the land, in order to make a desert bloom, as Isaiah said it would, in Isaiah 35. In order to do that, turns out it was hard work. So they went and they pulled out these rocks, one by one, out of the desert. And this is a joke the bus drivers tell, that uh, when God created the world, he took all the rocks, and he scattered half of them around the globe. And the other half, he put in Israel. And this is why it relates to us, because God says to you that he can pull out the stony heart. A new heart also will I give you. A new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. It's a picture for us of what he does in the spirit. First the natural, then the spiritual. First Adam, then Jesus. There's a picture for us. And if we track the restoration, we can see our own lives with Jesus in everything that he did in the Middle East. They had to drain the swamps, <clears throat> malarial swamps. People were dying, falling over by the dozens, by the hundreds. They had to drain the swamps themselves. In the middle of the country now, which is a garden, was a giant swamp. And they had to take all that wreckage out. And it's just like he says to you and he says to me, you that fear my name, shall the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings. You shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. I'm going to heal you. I'm going to take the swamp out of you. you. Anybody here find themselves in a malarial swamp and then Jesus got a hold of you? Anybody? I met some people this morning. They're very clear about it. You know, like, yeah, that's me. That's me. And God comes and he says, hey, let me take you up on my wings. There's a whole study here, by the way. That, those wings, that has to do with the prayer shawl. But that's another day. I have to have us come back. He heals us. He cleans us up. He takes the swamp out of us. He restores us. And he uses fresh water. Do you know that Israel is producing all of its own fresh water, surrounded by ocean on one side, the Mediterranean, and dirt and rocks on the other side? Because they're desalinizing the water. They're the ones that around, go around the world showing other countries how to take the ocean and turn it into water. They, he, Netanyahu came here to try to get Jerry Brown on the bus, and Jerry wouldn't do it. He wouldn't do it. But we can have all the water we need because we are going into a water-deprived world. If you've been in Africa or India, you know what I'm talking about already, but you understand that, that it's the, the most important resource on planet Earth. And the Israelis are developing ways to produce water for everyone. When you go home and turn on your irrigation system, thank a Jew. A biologist was wandering around in the Negev Desert, which is the southern part of Israel, and in the middle of nothing, there's rocks and scrub, there's nothing there, he sees a tree. He goes, oh, what's this? Why is that one tree right here? And he digs around, and there's a broken water pipe. Broken water pipe leads to the invention of drip irrigation. You have drip irrigation in your backyard because of Israel. You have little baby tomatoes because of Israel. I could go on and on. I'm telling you, this is, I'm not making that up. This is all true stuff. 
God knows what he's doing, and he's going to make it impossible for the world to hate the Jews. If, you, if I made you take out your cell phones again, and that seems so traumatic, I won't do it again. But if I made you take them out, the reason your cell phone is the way it is is because of Israel, because of the chips that they developed that then were, came to the states and were developed in Silicon Valley. There's an inestimable connection. Gosh, we even have a nonstop flight now because of all the high-tech people living in San Francisco and flying back and forth. There's a nonstop flight to Tel Aviv. Hallelujah. Let there be water. You are water. Jesus stood up on the last day of the feast and he said, If anyone thirsts, come to me. On the de last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, Sukkot, there's a water ceremony. And Jesus stood up and said, yeah, yeah, that's great. He didn't say it that way. But he, he, the, the water ceremony is amazing. But he stood up and said, I am the living water. And if you are in Jesus, you are living water to the world around you. Everywhere you go, people should be refreshed. Everywhere you go, people should feel, what is this? W what, what does this mean? What, can I know this? Can I? And, and it doesn't have to be complicated. You don't have to be a superstar. Try kindness. <laughs> Just kindness. Try generosity. Try the things that are aspects of a good, good father. And people will go, what? It, what? It's my wife's witnessing technique to the Jewish people. She'll say, thank you. And they'll say, what? What, what thank you? What? what? No, thank you. What? Thank you for the Bible. Thank you for the prophets. Thank you for the patriarchs. Thank you for the Psalms. Thank you for the wisdom writings. Thank you, above all, for my Messiah, for my Savior, Jesus. And now, by now, the Jew's crying. And which not because she's such a doll. You know, God just comes through her all the time, almost all the time. And, uh, <laughs> and, and, and they're crying, and they're having an experience of meeting the living God. Just go out. You're water. You are water. He's in you. Yeah. This is a picture of, of what happens when you take a rocky, mountainous desert area and you put in irrigation. This is Israel. This is the, the valley below Jerusalem, south of Jerusalem. And this is, that's all greenhouses and, and f food being grown. This little tiny country which exports food. It's been a, a, just an absolute fulfillment of the fruitfulness that God promised yeah. in Isaiah and the growth and the, just the expansion. That's what he has for you, yeah. to be more fruitful, to be greater blessed, to be a greater blessing to others, right? We, we've developed, in Israel, they've developed the, the highest quality of solar power because we need to. And one of my favorite stories about the solar power is a, a group called Innovations Africa. We lived in Africa for a season. I taught Bible there, and our kids were little. They were 10 and 7. They're 28 and 25 now. And we lived in the Congo, of course, during a war, because there's always a war in the Congo. But, but we, we were teaching there, and, and uh, when I heard about Innovations Africa, my heart was leaping because of our love for Africa. When you get Africa in your blood, it never goes out. It's just incredible. But we, Innovations Africa is a group of Israelis that are finding some of the worst places, desert, drought, destroyed sections of Africa. And they go in and they build solar power. They bring solar power, which then allows them to drill and pump water, which allows them to then grow crops, which allows them to then have cottage industries, which allows them to have a thriving economy. So these places in the middle of what we would call nowhere, somebody's home, you're nowhere is somebody's life, and, you know, it's their bread, it's their place. And the Israelis are going, and they're not going in the name of Jesus, they're just going because it's right to do, because they can. Because God is God, and God has blessed them with this technology. Hey, it works in the desert here, it'll work in Ethiopia, it'll work in Zambia, it'll work in all these places. And so they're just going, and they're just, just transforming these places in Africa. I saw a video about it, Innovations Africa, if you can look it up. I saw a video, and, and at the end, the people, because there's a lot of Christians in the area, in this, this one place where they were, and they're praising God, and the water is flowing everywhere. They've been in drought, drinking mud, dirt, and they, the water is spraying everywhere from the, from the sprinklers that they've placed, and these little kids are jumping around, thanking God, thanking Israel. And he's just like, why don't people know about this? <laughs> but now you know. All right. So you were, you were darkness, and now you are light. 
Once you were darkness, but now in union with the Lord, you are light. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. You know, some days are better than others. But the idea is we're in motion. We're moving forward, learning to walk with the Lord and to be light in the world around us. This is a picture of Tel Aviv at night. This was a sand dune in the 1920s. Nothing. Saw the guy with the shovel? That's this. It was a sand dune. This is Tel Aviv now. In less than 100 years, God has made a desert into one of the most high-tech, beautiful uh, places in the world. Why? Because he's God. And because he said he would, and he's doing it. What has he said to you? He'll do it. Just say amen. He says yes. You say amen. Yes. Amen. It's not that complicated. We make it busy. So one of the things that we've gotten to do, and I'm going to go over time today, so there you go. Feel free to leave if you're hungry. We have been able to minister alongside the Back to Jerusalem movement out of China. I think I had just been to China when I was here last. I'm not sure. I don't know who's here who was there. But, but we, they saw us on television, and they flew their point guy out to San Francisco to ask us to come and teach the Chinese pastors and leaders about this connection with Israel. So we've gotten very close with them, and we're, we're supporting them, and we're helping them. I do a podcast with one of their guys called Wall to Wall which is from the Great Wall of China to the Western Wall of Jerusalem. You can hear it on our website. But they have the, they've got this. They've got this bringing the gospel, bringing the light, bringing the water through the Muslim world back to Jerusalem. So we were, I interviewed them on television, on the Mount of Olives in Texas, here and the other, around all these Chinese missionaries and ministers. I didn't know they were at the same time, because they asked me some questions, and a guy was like, I didn't know they were building a nine-part video series that will go around the world explaining modern-day missions and what is going on in the nations of the world and how to support the Chinese missionaries who are one-way ticket people. They, they, a lot of them signed up for countries that you will never go to, and they may not return because they love Jesus. They go to the hardest places in the world. So I didn't know, but they were building this video series. So the first one has come out. I'm going to show you a clip of my, my meeting with, with uh, Brother Eugene, who was a, he's a retired U.S. Marine sniper, <laughs> who's the right guy for this job. And he, he interviewed me about the connection between Jerusalem and the nations of the world. So just take a minute to look at this. So where did it all start? What many would consider to be the center of the world. I've just arrived here in Israel, almost didn't make it. You can see that I actually travel quite a bit, so the security here, they had an issue for some of the countries that I go to. They pulled me to the side and I had to go through some pretty intense questioning for about four hours. But you know what? They have a right to be on edge. There's a lot of countries that are all around them that really want to destroy this place. So Israel, thank you for letting me in. What is it that makes this place so special? The Bible mentions Jerusalem nearly a thousand times. Jerusalem holds a fascinating collision of religions, cultures, and worldviews, all with their own claims to this small piece of land in the middle of the desert. It seems to be a place of endless tradition, tension, and conflict. But is there a tendency to feel like there is more religion than faith here? Is it just tradition instead of walking with God? In my hunger to learn about revival, is this just a place for the museums? Or is God still moving in Israel today? I'm going to be honest. I don't know exactly what I'm doing here. We're, we're kind of making this up as we go along. But part of what brought me to Jerusalem is a rabbi friend of mine Miles Weiss. Shalom. Hello. We are Jewish, but we know that Jesus is our Messiah. Miles is a Messianic Jewish believer who has spent his entire life taking Christians back to their Jewish roots, where he shares about the central role that Israel plays in world revival, missions, and end times. But when you went to Jerusalem for the first time, mm -hmm. was it as a Jew or as a Messianic well, believer? You know, you've heard of Jerusalem syndrome, where people go to Jerusalem and they have a breakdown and they wear a white shirt and they carry a staff and they think they're Elijah and they start, you know, they flip out. 
Well, I had Mount Carmel syndrome, which was weeping and having God reorder my DNA around my Jewish identity and my burning desire to see the world reconcile Jews and Arabs, Jews and Christians. I believe we're in the season, 1700 years after Constantine, where God is awakening Romans 9 through 11 for the entire world. Miles told me that this was his signature portion of scripture. It talks about God allowing Israel to be cut off so that the nations could be brought to faith and that he would again bring the people of Israel back to God in his time. If you read that literally, it is unmistakable that God has always intended this story of the Jewish people to run through history uh, in a term of chosenness, but with the proviso and the absolute assurance that whosoever will could be grafted into that story. And that at a certain point, those of us that were broken off by unbelief would be grafted back in. And this picture of the olive tree uh, that is so prevalent in Israel is one of the most beautiful pictures of what God's doing in the earth and what he's doing right now. I think of the misunderstanding of the word law. There's been a, a Marcionite heresy, really. Marcion was a first century heretic who divided the Bible into angry Jehovah, happy Jesus, bad Jews, good Christians, dangerous law, mercy and grace. But it's not that way, it's one long story. I have some friends who take that uh, in the Christian Bible, they take out that white page between uh, Malachi and Matthew and they circumcise it. They take a, take a razor blade and cut out that blank page because they want to refer to it as one long story. Yeah. Uh, somebody will say, oh, this tree is from the time of Jesus, but it's not. But it's the same guy who says shop where Jesus shopped. You know, kind of. <laughs> Tree, some of these trees are 800, 1200 years old. They're old trees. And what happens is when the tree gets old, it kind of gets hollow on the inside. And think of Israel as the, the old tree. And the, the shoots grow up from the ground. And you can actually see the striations as they wrap themselves around and become a support mm -hmm. to the old tree. And the, the word for those shoots is Netzer. Mm -hmm. Netzer is where we get the word Nazareth. It's mm -hmm. where we get the word Notzrim, which is the modern Hebrew word for Christian. Wow. So check this, the Notzrim are the shoots that are growing up around the base of the old tree and supporting the tree. 20 years ago, when the shopkeepers would see a Christian tour come by and the Chinese would be in the street waving flags and <laughs> doing what we do, the shopkeepers would say, ah, the Notzrim are here. Now, with a tear in their eye and a heart of gratitude, I hear them say, ah, the notes dream are here. Something is changing spiritually. This is dear to our hearts, is to see the to believe the millions of people that will participate in these Bible studies, and it's a way that we've been able to multiply our message and be able to connect with the, the heroes of the Chinese church and see this message go out. Now, they're going to go through all the nations. You're going to learn everything you want to know about missions through this video series. Whoops. And that's why, when he mentioned about Romans 9 through 11, that's why I'm currently teaching a series at Beit Abed, the father's house, called Heaven's 9-11. You know, America has their tragic 9-11, but God has a 9-11, and it's Romans 9 through 11. When I was in Bible college, we were taught that Romans 1 through 8 is the legal brief where Paul convicts us of sin. He's, got, he's an attorney. He's got this, that, the other. You, you, by the time you get to Romans 8, you know you need Jesus, and you better get him. You got to get saved, and that's why Romans 8 ends with this wonderful section of nothing can separate us from the love of God because that's the case that he builds of our need. But Romans 9 through 11, I was told, is kind of parenthetical. We don't really know what it means. And then we skip to Romans 12. Well, no. Romans 9 through 11 talks to us, the Roman church, and to us about not being arrogant about where we are in time and who we're related to and that we come from this little group called the Jews and how we're connected. 
That's why when you get to Romans 12 and he says, Therefore, I beg you, I beseech you by the mercies of God, you present, present your body a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Be not conformed to this world. Don't be a Greco-Roman thinker, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Let this word get in you that you might prove what is that good and perfect and acceptable will of God. And he's making this case for the connection between the church and Israel. So how deep is his love? And I'm going to end here. I saw you looking for lunch, lunch time. I got it. I'm ending here. How deep is his love? Every single letter in this book, if you look at it in Hebrew, and it's a lifetime study, I don't think we'll have enough time. He's going to take the millennial, a millennium time, a thousand years of Jesus reigning from Jerusalem. It'll take that much time to understand what's in this book. Because if you look at it in the Hebrew, it is elegant. It is gorgeous. It is full of incredible messages to you and to me. I'll give you one example. We're, with the Jews, we read the first five books of Moses through the year. This fi- it's broken into 54 passages, and every week we read something, right, in order. We learned it from Calvary Chapel. And then... <laughs> it's actually funny. Um, <laughs> at the end of the year, which we're coming up on, we roll up the scroll and we start over. The Bible, the Torah, the first five books of Moses end with the letter Lamed. Lamed is the L sound in Hebrew. And the last word in the Torah, in the five books of Moses, at the end of Deuteronomy, the last word is Israel, Yisrael. And so it ends with L, that le- Lev sound, this Lamed sound. You roll up the scroll, and then you open it at the beginning to start again. If you open it at the beginning, it starts, the whole Bible starts with the word Bereshit. Bereshit is in the beginning. Bereshit is the letter bet, or B, the B sound. If you roll up that scroll, you have a lamed and a bev, bet. If you have those two letters together, it spells the word heart, lev. God has written a love letter to the Jewish people for the whole world, and he put it in there so that when it's closed and started again, you can see his heart. So when you were taught that the law is bad and the grace is good, forget that because the basis of all civilization and any time we do anything right together, it comes back to these instructions that were given to Moses or through Moses. It won't save you. That's why we need Jesus. But it's full of good stuff that helps us live a righteous life. But not only so, this is the end end. Not only so, if you take the whole Bible that we use, the Christian Bible, from, from Bereshit, from in the beginning, to the amen at the end of Revelation 22. The last word in the whole Bible is amen. And the last letter in the whole Bible is nun. The nun sound, the N sound. If you take the very first letter in the Bible and you take it with the very last letter in the Bible, it spells the word ben, which is son. So God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And he took it and he put it from the beginning to the end of the entire scripture so that we could never ever forget that it's out of his heart of love that he gave us the Torah, gave us the word, and because he's so amazing, he also reminds us in the entire book that it's all about Jesus. Stand up. Thank you.